Professor Pandey, shall we start? The... Okay, I think like, we should start now. Let the people keep on joining later. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Sanan Bakchi, for accepting our invitation for this workshop. And uh, I welcome all and very good morning to everyone. And I request Professor Anil Kumar to kindly chair the session. Thank you, Professor Pandey. It's a really pleasure to be here this morning. So I welcome uh, everybody back to this Equip Faculty Development Program course, which is on structure and dynamics, biology and chemistry. So today, um, well, we have a, um, a very young uh, uh, speaker with us, Professor Sian Bakchi. Uh, so let us welcome him uh, to this uh, meeting. Professor Bakchi is a principal scientist in physical and material chemistry division, CSIR NCL Pune. Dr. Bakchi completed his BSc. Let me give you a brief introduction about Professor Bakchi. Uh, he has completed his BSc from Presidency College, Kolkata in 2000. And he uh, thereafter moved to IIT Kanpur for MSc, which he completed in 2002. He received his PhD degree from University of Pennsylvania, USA in 2008. And after the completion of PhD, Dr. Bakchi joined Stanford University as a postdoctoral fellow. And uh, Dr. Bakchi thereafter joined NCL in 2012 as a senior scientist. And presently, he is a principal uh, scientist there. Uh, Dr. Bakchi's research interest, let me share with you. Uh, his research interests include obtaining spectroscopic insight about complex scientific problems in the field of chemistry, biology, and material science, and I believe in, involved um, this uh, steady state as well as ultra fast spectroscopic technique. In this area, Dr. Bakchi group performed both experiments and computation to obtain a molecular understanding of the different chemical processes. Today, Professor Bakchi will be talking to us on two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy. As I see from his slide, um, he is going to talk about 2D IR a perspective. So I invite now uh, Professor Sian Bakchi to please uh, deliver his talk. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Anil Kumar, uh, for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, so I will start now. So as you see from the title of the slide, I will be talking something called two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy. And if we take the uh, first alphabets here, letters here, we get this 2D IR. So I will give a perspective of 2D IR. So we all know about IR spectroscopy or infrared spectroscopy. Now, these two dimensions of infrared, so the question that needs to be answered, which I will talk about later on, is what is this dimension I am talking about? But uh, before I go into the, all these things, let me try to... Uh, ask or you know pose some general questions and uh, so that it's easier for everyone to understand so let's say uh, so in chemistry we deal with different molecules it can be these uh, organic molecules uh, just hold on yeah it can be these organic molecules there's been small organic molecules uh, like ligands or even even bigger molecules like steroids. Some others who uh, were uh, doing research in chemistry or when we study chemistry in masters, we talk about this inorganic chemistry, where we talk about these metal complexes, the uh, the catalysts, 
And we also have even bigger molecules in biology, like proteins and enzymes. And now if you ask the question, or we can also think we have this, nowadays we are talking about these materials, smart materials and stuff. I mean, at, the, at some level, these are all different kinds of molecules. Now, if you ask the question, what are the similarities between all these different molecules that we read in organic chemistry, in organic chemistry, or biological or biochemistry? So the answer to this question will be, first of all, all these molecules have some structures, some well-defined structures. At least we know some bond angles, some bond lengths, and not only structures, they also interact. It, what, what I mean by that, if I put the same molecule in a different environment, they will interact differently. And also, not only they interact, they move around. That means no molecule is at rest at any point of time. So there is some dynamics. So now we see, so the similarities between these different molecules in organic, inorganic, and biochemistry, or even in materials, is that they have structures, they have interactions, they have dynamics. Now, if you ask the question, like, what are the differences? So the differences we'll see are the same. That means they have structures, but every molecule have different structure. So if we think about a biomolecule or different protein, we, the different proteins will have different structures. If you compare between an organic molecule and an inorganic metal complex and a biological molecule like an enzyme, they will all, all have different structures. And also these molecules, because they are composed of different atoms and which have like different partial charges, they will interact differently with the environment. So even though interaction is the common thing or the similarity, it is also the difference because these molecules interact differently with the same surrounding. And also they move around, but all these dynamics or this moving around happen in different time scales. In other words, if I think about a small molecule, that mole small molecule might move around faster. However, if you think about a bigger molecule, maybe on an average, the bigger molecule will have a slower motion or a slower time scale. Also, in the, in the same molecule we're talking about, it also depends on the surrounding. Depending on the surrounding, the motions will be different. So we see, if we compare all these different molecules, we have the similarities and the differences, the similarities and the differences boil down to the same three things, structures, interactions, and time. And most importantly, one of the common thing of all these uh, molecules is that they have some well-defined functions. And because they have these functions, that's why we have discovered them and we know them. So in other words, this structure-function relation in any molecule is extremely important. And the scientific community in different fields, in some way or the other, we are after in understanding the relation between the structure and the function. Now it has been well known that the structure function relation is actually governed by two important aspects. Again, one is this interaction that we talked about, and the other one is the dynamics. So now let's say we have any problem in chemistry or physics, and we want to understand this uh, structure-function relation, and we want to understand whether interaction plays the more important role or dynamics plays the more important role, and then it, it can be either interaction or dynamics, that means, or it can be partly interaction, partly dynamics. So in order to understand how this structure function uh, relation evolves, we can actually solve this problem in the lab 
two ways. One way is that we can either use a computer and uh, you know use a bunch of equations and calculations. And based on these equations and calculations or theory and computation, we can get some idea about what is the structure function relation. So this gives us a molecular level understanding, or in other words, it gives a microscopic understanding. However, the problem with theory is if I only have theory and my theoretical results are not backed up or proved by the experimental results, then what happens is that that is not even a theory that is in the level of hypothesis. So the other way, obviously, is to do experiments. So I can do experiments. And in theory, I might have used some assumptions because I can not do a, maybe a, cal a detailed calculation on a very big molecule. But experiments always provide us the real result. However, all the experiments actually provide us are a bunch of numbers. For example, if I do some kinetics experiment, I will get some uh, concentration in one column and the uh, time in the other column. So basically, I have two columns of numbers. And so experiments, and if I even have these numbers and try to uh, plot these numbers, I can get a trend. This will give a macroscopic understanding. But I will cannot understand the trend if I do not know the underlying theory. So in other words, experiments give us a bunch of numbers, which is macroscopic, which gives us macroscopic understanding, but we do not have the molecular level understanding. And theory gives us the macroscopic understanding, but without experiments, these are just hypotheses. So we need to bridge the gap between the theory and experiment. And the bridge can be formed by spectroscopy. Because if you look into the history of any spectroscopy, the way spectroscopy came into being, the theory of spectroscopy and the spectroscopy experiments, they developed independently. And over time, they kind of merged and caught up with one another. So now, because they independently develop both the theory part and the experimental part, we, these experiments and theory, the common ground can be explained using spectroscopy. So you see, I started with two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy. So the first thing we talked about, how spectroscopy can be important in research, maybe in organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, biochemistry, or materials chemistry. So in other words, spectroscopy brings this theory part and the experimental part under one umbrella. So now, the main goal is to understand the relation between structure and function. And how the structure function relation happens on the basis of interaction and dynamics. So in our lab, we are both interested in interactions and dynamics. But today, I will talk about 2DIR, which mainly focuses on the strength of 2DIR is the dynamics part. So for interactions, we actually do the conventional spectroscopy, which involves the steady state spectroscopic techniques. We also use some other kind of spectroscopy, which is vibrational stark effect spectroscopy. However, the steady state information gives us a time average information. So this spectroscopy, as we know, is the interaction between light and matter. So in a steady state experiment, we have one interaction between light matter. So one light matter interaction. However, we know because the molecules are constantly moving, all these interactions at any point of time are transient. That means they will change over time. They will go back and forth or they might evolve over time. 
So in order, these transients in these interactions can be understood by studying the dynamics. So now in order to study dynamics, I need time information. That means how the system changes over time. And if I want to understand how the system changes over time, at least I need two light matter interactions. That means I need to know how the system was at one point of time. And then I need to interrogate the system again with light at some other point of time. Then only I will know how the system changed from the initial point or the initial configuration to this present configuration. So in other words, for dynamics, we need, need time-resolved information. And time-resolved information is obtained by multiple light matter interactions. So this 2D IR, or whatever we are interested in our lab, which actually deals with ultra-fast dynamics. So I will come to this ultra-fast part also. So, we, as we have discussed, this understanding the structure function relation is important and dynamics plays an important role in the structure function relation. And even though interactions are important, for example, hydrogen bonds, this is an interaction, hydrogen bonding is an interaction, but because of this fluctuation, hydrogen bonds will make and break. So these interactions are transient. And this needs multiple light matter interactions and 2D IR or the interaction time or the dynamics time scale we're interested is the like femtoseconds or, the, or to picoseconds to femtoseconds. So picosecond is 10 to the power minus 2 uh, seconds and uh, 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 minus 4 seconds and femtosecond is 10 to the power minus 15 seconds. So now we know that light is one of the fastest things we ever know. So in one picosecond, what light travels, how much, what distance, is the thickness of the wall of a Coca-Cola. So if you take the Coke can and think about the thin wall of the can, light travels that much distance in one picosecond. So you can see, even though this is the fastest thing we know, the, which is a very small distance is traveling. And we are interested in that process, whatever happens in that small amount of time when light merely passes through the wall of a Coca-Cola. So the question that might arise, why are we interested in those fast processes? So we are interested, first of all, this IR is a ground state phenomena, ground electronic state phenomena. And on our most of the processes, that happen maybe in our body, somewhere else, are always uh, at this ground electronic state. So what we want to know is how to look at these fast molecular processes without changing them. That means changing them or exciting them. That means under thermal equilibrium conditions. And why these ultra-fast motions? Because these fundamental steps of any process, we can take maybe a protein folding. You might have heard about protein folding. You might say the protein folds in milliseconds. But the fundamental steps of the first step of this protein folding, they happen on very, very fast time scales. And this entire process of protein folding, which might seem to be slow, occur through sequences of these very fast states. In other words, I say this, you know, when a slow process happens, there is no alarm clock in this process. So, it's not that if I have a millisecond process, the system will not do anything for a millisecond and suddenly there will, the alarm clock will ring and the system will perform. No. The system will, there will be lots of changes going on at different time scales. And the cascade effect of all these systems will lead to the final change, the bigger change that we observe maybe in a second or a millisecond. So, we are talking about time scales here. And I am just trying to build up because I need to, un uh, you, to understand the time scales and the IR and the spectroscopy for this two dimensional infrared spectroscopy. So, if you look, think about any biological process. 
So you will see that biological processes cover over 25 orders of magnitude. For example, if you think about the evolution of species, a typical duration is 0 0.4 million years. If you think about seconds, it's 1.2 times 10 to the power 13 seconds. So if, if you can see the example from Homo machines to Homo sapiens. Now, if you think about a population formation, it takes about 100 years at least. And that is three times 10 to the power nine seconds. So 10 to the power nine. For example, it's you can equivalent a time for which they were the forest take to grow. Now, if you think about an animal movement, we come to a second time scale or of zero or even sub second. So if you think about this hand gestures, or you can think about the hummingbird flapping the wings. So this happens in a second or just below second time scale. Now, if you think about an enzymatic reaction or a biochemical reaction, that happens from seconds to 10 to the power minus 5 seconds. So now we are going 10 to the power negative. So we get thinking about the signaling processes, the protein synthesis. And if we, if we go to even further elementary biological processes, we go to this picosecond, nanosecond, or even femtosecond processes, and these involve the fluctuations, the conformational changes, the two states in a protein that kind of interchanging. So you see, we started from million years to picoseconds or femtoseconds, or we started from 10 to the power plus 13 seconds, we can think about a 10 to the power minus 13 seconds. And the entire biology spans this kind of a range. So even if you think about someone only thinks about some slow process, things are happening at very fast time scales, which can kind of cascade and accumulate, and the final results we see at much slower time scales. So now we have no single instrument that can cover the dynamics over this 25 years orders of magnitude. So if you think about what is the slowest instrument that we have. I can say it's a calendar, or you can think about a radi radiocarbon dating. Even we want to have a faster instrument. Nowadays, we, I, uh, we used to talk about digital cameras. Then we have these SLRs, DSLRs. And now we can even click good pictures, uh, you know, with good time resolution, maybe shutter speed and stuff, uh, in, even in mobile. And even if we think of the fastest tool, we have these lasers which has this femtosecond, uh, we are talking about femtosecond pulses. I know Arthur who talked about attosecond processes. So we know the speed of light is three to 10 power eight meters per second. So now, we, I just talked about one picosecond is this Coca-Cola thickness of a Coca-Cola can wall. Now let's try to figure out how much light travels at different time points. So if you think about one second, it travels over 30,000 kilometers. So it's like, you know, distance between America and India. If you think about uh, one millisecond, it covers about 300 kilometers, which is like uh, half the distance of like Delhi and Udai. Now, if you think of a microsecond, then the light travels maybe at the perimeter of a football field. In a nanosecond, it travels one foot, and picosecond, I said, thickness of a Coca-Cola can. And I also mentioned we're also interested in femtoseconds. So if you think, if you take this water puddle, sometimes we, it's light shines on this water puddle, we see this oily layer which looks like reflects and looks like a rainbow. So the thickness of this rainbow colored water fi oil film on this water puddle, that thin film, that is the distance that light travels in a femtosecond. So, and we know this is the fastest known thing, and it travels such a small distance during the entire event. And I'm talking about, now you might be confused that if light travels such a small distance, how can a big molecule like protein even make any kind of a, uh, changes, any kind of changes or movements or dynamics in that small time? So we'll talk about that. So these fast events, these fastest events, are these ultra-fast events we are talking about, these ultra-fast events. 
and this ultra fast spectroscopy of which 2ti is an example this kind of spectroscopy there are other kinds of spectroscopy other than 2 dir which are also ultra fast so this spectroscopy explores atoms and molecules using light based spectroscopy techniques involves multiple light matter interactions and to follow this ultra fast events we need time resolution so what do i mean by time resolution if you see these two pictures the picture on the left actually look kind of hazy the wings of this hummingbird it's kind of hazy you cannot really uh, see the like, the wings are not that crisp that means by the time i took the picture the hummingbird has flapped the wings so many times that i have covered all these different events and finally what i got in an, is an average of all these events on this other on the other hand the right hand side picture is pretty crisp so the equipment which i'm using to take the picture or in spectroscopy the equipment we're using to probe or follow the processes or the events in a molecular level the equipment should involve some changes whose time range is faster than the process under investigation in other words if hummingbird flaps the wings let's say in a second and the camera exposure is very short let's say 1 millisecond then the motion of the wing during the exposure is negligible and that's why i can get a static picture and i get the right hand side picture however the exposure is more than the time scale of the flapping of the wing or of the hummingbird then i will get an average so for that if i want to study let's a picosecond process i would need what i would say a femtosecond pulse so before if i go into the pulse because we are talking about infrared two dimensional infrared spectroscopy and i talked about spectroscopy and i told you this is an ultra fast process i have talked we have talked about this uh, what is ultra fast and the time scales and the distance correlation between the time of light so now normally with infrared spectroscopy or any absorption technique it can be uv rays also when we talk about this infrared or this absorption techniques we immediately remember the beer lambert that means light falls on the sample passes to the sample there is an initial intensity i0 of the light and a part of some frequency of the intensity is absorbed by the sample so the intensity if the sample absorbs the intensity that comes out is less so i is less than i0 and based on this expression we define something called absorbance and this is epsilon cl we have the extinction coefficient concentration dependence path length dependence but this is the steady state information in other words we do not know what is exactly happening over time in the sample solution so this i will call linear infrared spectroscopy or ir absorption spectroscopy so as you understand when we say something linear that means one dimension so i call this spectrum as one dimension because when we plot this spectrum we have two axes one is the x axis and the one is the y axis so on the y axis we plot the intensity or the absorbance and on the x axis we plot the dimension the dimension of the light or the length the wavelength in case of the uh, uv rays absorption and in case of ir we plot wave number so this x axis or this the dimension of light we are talking about is the dimension that determines the dimension of the spectroscopy the intensity is not considered as the dimension of the spectroscopy so in other words because we have only one 
dimension here, that is the wave number. This is a one-dimensional infrared spectroscopy or linear infrared spectroscopy, which is commonly known as IR absorption spectroscopy. So now the question is: let's say this is another, let's say this is an IR, this is an IR spectrum of some mode. Let's say this is a carbon monoxide mode or a metal carbonyl mode, some, some mode I think. So this mode absorbs around this 1930. However, because I am talking about a solution, let's say I am having five millimolar sample. So I have some a solution consists of a solute and a solvent. So I have lots of solute molecules. You see, I have like 10 to 18, 19 solute molecules. And each of these solute molecules are oriented in a slightly different way. That means because of this slight different orientation, let's say I'm talking about the C triple bond O, the C triple bond O would experience a slightly different environment. And because they have a slightly different environment, what happens is that they have slightly different frequencies. So this is one way easier way we can try to understand because they have slightly different frequency so the spectrum is not a line but it is broad that means there is contribution from different frequencies in a range because the chemical group is oriented in a slightly different way in different molecules which leads to different environments which leads to different frequencies that means we have different distribution now let's say I take the solution and I do the experiment. However, after doing the experiment, I get hungry. I said, okay, I need to have some lunch break or some tiffin break. And I keep the sample and let's say the sample is non-degrading. The sample will not change over time, the chemical composition. However, the molecule will keep on moving because we know the molecules are never at rest. We, talk, we know about from IR, we talk about zero point energy. So I am now I have had my snacks or lunch and I came back to the lab and I do the experiment. So the experiment, my question, so I have a question, somebody I would uh, ask, uh, can you please answer? Would you expect the exact same spectrum or a different uh, IR absorption spectrum? Anyone? Am I audible, by the way? Okay, someone said different. So, so it's no, it's not different. So, it's the same spectrum. See, when you go to this database of IR spectrum, I'm not even talking about 2D IR, I'm talking about 1D IR absorption spectrum that you collect or, or let's say UV spectrum also. We know that when we collect a spectrum and we and when someone publishes a spectrum in a, in a paper, they did not write that I have taken this spectrum before lunch at 12.30 p.m. No, that means that particular molecule will always be the same spectrum. So now the question is, but the molecules are different. Uh, the molecules are moving. So if they're moving and I say it, because of this motion, the environment will change. And because the environment will change, there will be dynamics. And because there will be dynamics, then the question is, how is that reflected? So the thing is, there is dynamics. So let's say one molecule was here, and it was contributed to this part of the frequency. This molecule will go somewhere else when I come back after lunch, because it will have the same environment as a different molecule and it will contribute to the different part of its frequency. So all these molecules will keep on uh, moving around. So there is a sampling space or the conformation of space. And because we have lots and lots of molecules, we are kind of at any time, we have contribution from all these different uh, conformations. But then this FTIR or Iron absorption uh, spectroscopy, uh, experiment or spectrum, this will not give you 
the information about the dynamics. Even though the system is moving, and we know, we, though we get the same spectrum, everything is moving around, we cannot get this information. Even though the information is there, it's buried under this one broad peak. So now here comes the two dimensional infrastructure. So you see, this was one dimension because it was one frequency or wave number dimension we are talking about. Now, this two dimension means so you can think this spectrum as we have actually we have intensity and one frequency dimension, as I mentioned before. So a two-dimensional spectrum means we have two frequency dimensions and the third one. So we can think about the x, y, and z axis. So the x and y axis are two different frequencies. And the z axis is the intensity. And so because what two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy does, instead we are not limited anymore to one dimension, but it spreads the spectral information along two dimensions. And now I can think that if I can perform this multi experiment, and one of these frequencies are the initial frequency, let's say here. And because uh, the molecule has moved over time, that particular molecule has gone somewhere else. So in the other axis, so let's say this is X and Y axis. So in the X axis, let's or uh, Y axis, let's say I, I'm plotting, let's say Y axis, I'm plotting the initial frequency. And then I'm letting the system to evolve over time to move around, then I'm bringing a second light matter interaction. Now, that, that light matter interaction is finding that particular molecule in a different environment with a different frequency. So what I'm plotting, the initial frequency of a molecule versus final frequency of a molecule. And because we don't have a single molecule, it gives a distribution. So that is, that means we are spreading the dynamics, we're getting the dynamics information by spreading the frequency or, or the spreading the spectrum in or stretching the spectrum into different uh, dimensions. And because now we have two dimensions and the third one is the intensity which is common for any spectrum, it is called two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy. So, before we go into two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy, I'll give a very brief, brief experiment uh, overview of any time-resolved experiment. So the easiest time-resolved experiment to understand is a pump probe experiment. So the optical and vibrational uh, spectroscopy, uh, any measurement. So for example, <laughs> the optical and vibrational measurements are important because even for these bond fluctuations, which happens in any molecules or protein, this incorporates the time scales of these bond vibrations. And to follow these ultra fast events, as I mentioned, I need a very short something to interrogate, short light. So what we create is very short laser flashes, which are called pulses. And the time resolved experiments, as we know by now, is a multiple light matter interaction. So in a pump probe experiment, we have a pump pulse which interacts at the system focused at the sample. So the pump pulse excites, let's say, from the ground to the excited state. And after a time delay, we bring in the probe pulse. And when the probe pulse is also focused at the uh, point but the pump pulse was focused at the sample, and the probe pulse, what happens because this excited state has So that means because of this, uh, what will happen? It will come down over time. So if I bring the probe pulse as, as, a, as, a, as a function of time delay, as the probe pulse increases, and if you measure the transient concentration or how much molecules are there in the excited state, I will see that signal will decay over time. And if you fit this curve, we will get the time scale, which will give us the lifetime of the excited state. So this is the easiest 
uh, you know, time resolved experiment we can think of. And depending on these short laser flashes or how short we are making it, we can do bump probe experiment in nanosecond time scales, picosecond time scales, femtosecond time scales, depending if we have nanosecond pulses, picosecond pulses, femtosecond pulses. So, but this lifetime is an inherent property of the molecule. What about the fluctuation? Because all I talked about before, the mo molecules you know, wiggle and jiggle over time. And because of this, to understand this wiggling and jiggling, that means the fluctuations, we need to understand how fast or how slow they move around. Or in other words, if I put the same molecule in different environment, will the molecule fluct molecular fluctuations become slower? Or if I change the molecule, keep the environment the same, will the fluctuation be same or different? So you can think about any molecular fluctuations, protein fluctuations, or even a molecule making a hydrogen bond with a solvent, solute-solvent interaction. So we know that hydrogen bonds make and break. So the question is, what are the time scales? or the dynamics of this hydrogen bond making and breaking or protein fluctuation. So for that, we need two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy. And I will try to explain two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy using the pump probe function. So let's say we have any mode, we know any chemical group or a bond which, gives, which is either active and when we talk about this vibrational spectroscopy, we learn to start, we start learning from simple harmonic oscillator. And then we say that, you know, because the simple harmonic oscillator cannot be the ultimate solution because then the bond will never break. And the chemistry to the students immediately say then the chemical reactions cannot happen because chemical reactions all about bond breaking and bonding. So we, then we talk about anharmonicity and we talk about one of this model and harmonic oscillator is Mohr's oscillator. So more importantly, we should not even care about the potential or the energies. All we know, the take home we have from the, our spectroscopy classes is that it just doesn't look like a symmetric parabola anymore. So as the bond increases, it becomes flatter. <clears throat> At some point it will be parallel to the axis, which is the dissociation limit. And we have these vibrational states, V equals zero, V equals one, V equals two, and the energy difference decreases as we go higher up the ladder or the energy. So let's say we think about a pump probe experiment. So what will happen when I actually pump the system? So it goes to the excited state. It actually does not go to the excited state. I will come back to later. It creates something called a superposition of states. I will mention that. But let's say it goes to the excited state. Now I bring the second pulse after a certain amount of time. And because this frequency and time are inversely related, that means if I have a very narrow pulse, let's say femtosecond, so very in time domain is extremely short, that means in frequency domain, it will be extremely broad or long. In other words, that means it will cover a long range of frequencies. So in other words, I am not only exciting this energy, but I have a pulse which covers the entire energy range. So when I bring the my, let's say, my uh, molecule is now somewhere here, let's assume, if when I bring the second pulse, it might actually create a stimulated emission, which will bring it back to V equals zero. So what is the frequency involved? This is my omega zero one. This was my pump frequency. And the probe pulse, which probes the frequency is also omega zero one, because we're thinking this way, it is going up, it's coming down, it involves the same frequency. So, if you plot the pump frequency on the y-axis and probe frequency on the x-axis, then what we will get, we will get something, some, it, because the peaks are, these are, I said, these are broad, so I will get a peak along the diagonal, 
this is different because it is both on the y axis and x axis is omega 0 1. However, the other possible is it might create another absorption which will take it because my laser pulse also covers this kind of frequency. It will take it from on, instead of zero, 1 to 0, it will take it from 1 to 2. So now you see the pump pulse involves 0 to 1, that means omega 0 1 frequency, and the probe pulse involves omega 1 2. And as we know, because in real molecules, it's an anharmonic oscillator, that means this frequency will be less. So if the frequency increases to the right, my peak is, will be towards the left of the red peak. So that is my 1 to 2 transition peak, which is probed by the probe pulse. And the difference between this the center of this red peak and the blue peak is the vibrational enhancement. So in other words, this is the basis of a 2D IR spectrum if you try to understand from a pump proof kind of experiment. So we can see the first thing we can directly get, and we do not need to rely on quantum chemical calculations or quantum mechanical calculations, is that we can directly get the enharmonicity of a particular vibrational mode from 2D experiment. And depending on how broad are the peaks, they can be separate red and blue peaks, or they can be overlapping red and blue peaks. So now, let's go back to these same questions. So we are interested in understanding the dynamics, which we could not get from the FTIR or linear IR or IR absorption spectrum. So also, if we think about what kind of dynamics we can think about, ideally, the dynamics we can categorize as two different kinds. Broadly speaking, we can roughly categorize to, for, our, for better understanding. One is the dynamics within this peak. What I said, it was at zero time, some particular bond of a particular molecule was here. And at time, it kind of diffused through the spectrum. And let's say this is my uh, point uh, where I have at after time t. And because with time it is diffusing through the spectrum, this process is known as spectral diffusion. So this process gives us the fluctuation dynamics. That means the system is fluctuating and within the distribution, each molecule is changing over time. However, there can be interchange between two different distributions. Here we are talking about one distribution, but we can think about two different distributions. Let's say I have a hydrogen bonded peak and a non-hydrogen bonded peak. And so, hydrogen, so whenever the molecule is hydrogen bonded, it will be in one peak, in one distribution. Whenever it's not hydrogen bonded, it will be in the other distribution. So you can think about a shuttling between two different distributions. And there can be cases not only in hydrogen bond making and breaking, there can be even two different states in a protein that are moving back and forth. So someone can assume that hydrogen bond dynamics will be much faster because this, it's just mo uh, motion of a, let's say a small molecule, a water molecule making a hydrogen bond with a small molecule. On the other hand, if you think about a protein and entire alpha helix arms moving back and forth, then it might involve a longer time scale. So there also we want to know, is there an ultra-fast component in those bigger systems? Or if we think that we have a materials case, material system, and people do this ligand exchange of these nanoparticles, and then this, we want to know whether the ligand, how it is bound on the nanoparticle, we can find the dynamics, how whether there can be, we can think about cases when the ligands are bound to the uh, nanoparticle and is fluctuating. Depending on strongly or weakly they're bound, the fluctuation time scale will be different. We can think about it is not freely bound, it's carving, uh, forming a kind of a shell around it. Immediately, because it's not bound, the fluctuation time scale will be faster. And also, if we think about 
let's say the molecules are going back and forth from solution to bound binding to the nanoparticle coming back to the solution there's kind of equilibrium then we can think about an exchange process that means two different distributions going back and forth so 2d ir can actually look into all these different kinds of dynamics which involves a single distribution fluctuation which is the structural fluctuation also the conformational exchange or chemical exchange you might have heard about this term if you think if you have heard about nmr and two dimensional nmr so this is the same process at a different time scale we are talking about a process happening in femtoseconds to picosecond time scale but the same making and breaking of these different interactions we are talking about transients of this interactions so in 2d ir so steady state ir ftir involves one light matter interaction 2d ir actually it involves three light matter interactions so now if i try to understand what happens during each of these interactions so if someone solves you know some physicist solves entire quantum mechanics of this light matter inter interaction using a perturbation theory uh, then you will see one light matter interaction or odd light matter interaction will create something known as coherence or coherent superposition of states that means the molecule is oscillating between v equals zero and v equals one after the first interaction because it's oscillating that means if i bring in the second pulse I can find the system either in V equals zero or V equals one, depending like which system in that ensemble and when I am breaking the pulse. So there is probability of finding at V equals zero and V equals one. In other words, all we should understand that there is kind of an oscillation that is going on. And because we have an ensemble of molecules, and I said each molecule has a slightly different environment, then which gives rise to different frequency. So what are these frequencies? These are the frequencies of oscillation. So because of different frequencies, we have different oscillation frequencies of different molecules in an ensemble after the five last, after the first light matter interaction. The second light matter interaction stops this oscillation. And this, has, this can be also shown from quantum. So uh, stops this oscillation, it creates a state that is known as the population. And this is the period where is all these the, uh, dynamics, which we call in homogeneous dynamics, in biomolecules, in other small molecules, organic, inorganic molecules that we're interested in. That means this is the time, whichever potential energy surface it is in, it is scanning that particular potential energy surface. Now, let's, if I bring the third pulse, and I mention any odd pulse will create a coherence, it will create another oscillation. Again, the similar oscillation after the first. However, depending on the time delay between the first and second pulse, the final oscillation frequencies can be same or different from the initial oscillation. Let's say I bring the second and third pulse almost together and the molecules have no time to fluctuate. Then the initial oscillation frequency and after the first interaction and the final oscillation frequency after the third interaction will be same. But if I actually make a big time difference between when I bring the first and the second and the third pulse, then I can have a lot of dynamics and because of the dynamics environment change and so the interact so the oscillation frequency of the initial oscillation frequencies and the final oscillation frequencies they will change over time so in 2d ir the different time delay between the first and second pulse because we can vary these time delays so this is known as this is normally denoted as tau which is the tau is the coherence period that is where the coherence happens then the second interaction stops the coherence creates a population and this is called the waiting time that means we're waiting for a certain amount of time before we are bringing the third pulse it's also called the population period and after we bring the third pulse actually there is another oscillation the final oscillation and 
Then we have a signal that is emitted because of these oscillating dipoles. And this signal is actually sprayed in a monochromator and detected by an IR detector. So in monochromator, what happens? The signal is kind of sprayed into different frequency components. And the IR, this is an array detector. That means it concerns of multiple, let's say, strips. And let's say each strip can detect one frequency. And because this monochromator, we can think this as a prism kind of experiment. This is a grating. So we know we, white, we pass white light to a prism with breaks down component colors. So we have these different colors here or different frequencies. Uh, of, uh, and then each, uh, these, or each of these arrays, each of these elements will detect a particular frequency. And not only frequency, if some frequencies absorb more, we'll have more intensity. If some frequencies absorb less, we'll have less intensity. So let's say at zero time between the first, the third, and the second and the third pass. That means we do not wait. The waiting time is zero. Let's say we have some frequency. And also there is a time delay between the first and second, which is denoted by tau, the point. So if you plot all the different intensities of, of the different frequencies, it looks like a spectrum. Let's say. This is just a cartoon representation for your understanding. So we can think about a spectrum. We can construct a spectrum. And now, if I actually scan this time delay between the first and second pulse, so for every time difference, I will get a spectrum. And so in a one experiment, this time delay is constant and this is scanned. So what will happen? So I will get a spectrum and because the spectrum will change over time. And, and there will be another time axis, we can think about in this axis, which is the time delay between the first and second. So we will have the data, which is time in one axis and frequency on the other axis. And if you Fourier transform the time, we will get the 2D IR spectrum. So what is the 2D IR spectrum? So 2D IR spectrum will be, as I mentioned, we have, let's say, one intensity in one axis, another uh, one frequency in one axis, and the other frequency in the other axis, which gives the two dimensions, two frequency dimensions. And of course, as I mentioned, in any spectrum, there is an intensity dimension. So let's say there is an intensity. So let's say you are, it looks like a mountain. This looks like a crest here. And this is the valley. So if you kind of on a helicopter on top of the mountain, or in other words, if you take the helicopter view, what you will see, you will see something like the contour plot. So what you will see all the points, or what is the contour diagram? That means all the points with the same intensity are connected by the one contour line. So what I will expect, I will expect a point here and circles around it so if I go from top to down. And so the, this is the most intense part. This is the top of the mountain and this is as I go down the mountain. So in other words, because we call it two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy or 2 di spectroscopy, we are converting the three-dimensional plot what two-dimensional plot? We do not are plot. We are not plotting the intensity separately, but we are still keeping the spectrum in two dimensions, but the two frequency dimensions. So one frequency at the pump frequency or the initial frequency or the initial oscillation frequency. The other is the final probe frequency, which is the final oscillation. So our correlation plot between the initial oscillations and the final oscillations will give us the 2 di spectrum. So you see, as I mentioned, this is the 2 di experiment, and this is the 2 di spectrum. So we have the initial frequency on the y-axis, on the final frequency on the x-axis. It's up to us which axis, what I want to plot. There will be people who will be plotting initial frequency on the x-axis, final frequency on the y-axis, it can be, it's, it's just a matter of choice. 
Now you see this is my diagonal as I mentioned. This is my diagonal peak, which is because of pumping 0 to 1 and probing 0 to 1. That is the stimulated uh, emission kind of a thing. And when we have these kind of processes, that means it goes from P equals 1 to 2, then the peak will be shifted in frequency. And let's say this side frequency decreases to the left. So it will shift it. And the distance between the frequency difference between these two centers of this mountain, which has been flattened by the contour map, will give us the vibrational energy. So let's now try to understand the dynamics. So let's say I am first talk about, let's first talk about the conformational fluctuation. So as I mentioned, in the same distribution, there are these different frequencies. That means there are ensemble of molecules and each molecule has a slightly different environment. And let's say each molecule is color coded, the vibrational mode of that molecule, or these color codes actually shows the identity of molecule. So we have a blue molecule, green molecule, violet molecule for our understanding, and all these different colors are have, do have different frequencies. Now let's say I have this time difference between two and three when it can when it can, when it can scan the potential energy surface. If this time delay is too small, then fluctuations or dynamics won't happen. So if the dynamics or the or I'm saying that the time delay is smaller than the fluctuation time scale. So in that case, what will happen? I will get the same ordering of this color. That means nothing has happened. So if I plot the initial frequency and the final frequency of all these different color codes in a two-dimensional plot, what I am plotting, I am plotting, you know, on x-axis, I am plotting final frequency, y-axis, I am plotting initial frequencies. And because the initial and the final frequencies are the same, they did not change in this very small time. So I am plotting something like x equals y. And we know x equals y is like a diagonal. And so we have a, we have a uh, 2D spectrum, which is elongated along the diagonal. Now, if we keep on increasing in a different experiment, same sample, we do the experiment on larger time delay. You see now the yellow was second here from the left, now it is first from the left. The green was fourth from the left, now it's fifth from the left. So some of these molecules have changed places, but some of the other molecules have not. So what it means, it means I have x equal to y for some of these molecules, and for some other molecules, I have some x not equal to y starts happening. In other words, if I have x not equal to y, things will move away from the diagonal and we will have a plot which is plotted. So now, if I even have a bigger time delay, so all these frequency levels will be scrambled. From a molecular point of view, I can think that all these different uh, molecules, the individual molecules they have kind of sampled all the different conf conformational space, configurational space, and the shape will even change. And from elongated along the diagonal, it will become more upright or circular. And so in an experiment, let's say I want to look into a particular vibrational group, it's a nitrile or a carbonyl or a C triple bond O, I will tune my laser in that particular frequency and focus on the sample. So it excites that particular mode in the sample. And as we see, at this, as a function of time, the line shape changes. And because the line shape changes, so analysis in the changes in this line shape or the shape of the peak will give us the time scale of the fluctuation of any molecular process, protein, materials, whatever. So what is more important in IR, we get a very local information. Because we can think that different parts of the protein will different, move differently. 
So you might think about, you know, there are different domains in the protein, then the fluctuations of different domains might be different. So if I put a vibrational probe in one domain and do the experiment and find the fluctuation dynamics, then I move the probe in a different domain and look into the different fluctuation dynamics, different time scale, that will give us local information about these fluctuations, how different parts of the same molecule are moving in different time scales. And then the question is, how do we actually uh, analyze the peak shape? So you see, one way to do this is what initially people wanted to do, it looks at an ellipse, and then it moves to more circular. So if you think about an ellipticity, which has a minor axis and a major axis, it goes to like one axis that is a circular. So if you measure the ellipticity and as a function of time, you plot the ellipticity, you can finally get some, you know, you know, a decay thing which will give you, fitting this decay will give you the times. There are other ways, what people now do, uh, de do is, they take uh, slices along one axis. If you take a slice, you can see these different colors are different heights in the, of the mountain. So if you think this way, then the mountain rises, again falls and goes straight. So we will get, we will get like a spectrum for all these different slices. And if we actually connect the maxima of these different uh, peaks of the different slice spectrums, then we will see, because the peaks are changing, the slope of this line connecting all the maxima will change. It will go from along the diagonal to totally vertical. And now, if we plot the inverse of the slope, we know that this is x equals y. So the slope is 1. And because y equals mx. So m equals 1, x equals y. Inverse of 1 is also 1. So let's, we can think we can start from a 1. And then here, this is perpendicular, so the slope is infinity. And because the slope is infinity, the inverse of the slope is 1 by infinity tends 0. So that, that means when all the dynamics will occur, and finally the dynamics has happened, this signal, which will obtain by analyzing the peak shapes, will, will come to 0. In other words, we are starting from something towards the diagonal and the slope will kind of move towards the left if you think here, and in this quadrant if you think it will move towards the right, and it will become perpendicular. And the inverse of the slope is plotted here, and this is known as the center line slope. So now I have mentioned that this is the fluctuation time scale we can get. But what about this exchange process, this hydrogen bond making and breaking? For example, as you see here, this is a process of acetic acid timer. So this hydrogen bond is made and broken from time to time. So we can think about in a potential energy surface, this is a double well potential. And we have one state here, let's say hydrogen bonded, non-hydrogen bonded, they're going back and forth because the barrier is small. If you think about in terms of IR spectrum of let's say a carbonyl mode, it means the carbonyl, because it's either hydrogen bonded or not hydrogen bonded happening from time to time, we'll have one peak where some molecules are hydrogen bonded, and we have an ensemble molecule, some other molecules that instead of time are non-hydrogen bonded. So this time average spectrum will show us two peaks, but it will never tell us what is the time scale which goes like back and forth, like what is the time scale of this interchange or chemical exchange. So if you think to tie, think about now in terms of 2D IR, we can think here that this 2D IR, we have two different distributions. Let's say the red is the hydrogen bonded, the blue is the non-hydrogen bonded. And if again, we have very small, small time delay, which is much smaller than the hydrogen bond dynamics, making and breaking dynamics, though the hydrogen bonded system will remain hydrogen bonded, the non-hydrogen bonded system will remain non-hydrogen. So in other words, this red or the blue, they will not change distributions. But as I make this delay longer and longer, it might happen when the first oscillation or the first during the pumping process, the molecule is hydrogen bonded. But I bring the third pulse much, much later. 
So by that time, it, some of the molecules have changed state from hydrogen bonded to non-hydrogen. So I can, you can see some, some of this red will become blue, some of this blue will become red. So we are having some kind of scrambling, little bit. And if you have a very, very long time delay, which is anyway we know much longer than kind of the uh, process we are talking about, then there will be huge scrambling. So the red, maybe a lot of them has gone toward the blue distribution, a lot of blue has come to the red distribution. So what will happen initially, we'll have two peaks along the diagonal. This is the omega, there's a pump frequency, probe frequency, whatever we can think about. And now, because the red becomes red, the blue becomes blue, we will have only peaks along the diagonal. As we've seen for a single distribution, we had a single peak. This is a cartoon, I'm not talking the shape here. But as time goes on, because there is transition from A to B or B to A, so initially I see in one frequency, finally the pulse, this is in another frequency. So the initial frequency is B frequency, the final frequency is A frequency, I will have cross peaks between A and B. In other words, I will, this is a real experimental data, when this is, a, this is a 2D spectrum you can think about, this is not a contour spectrum, but it's, this is shown in three dimensions to make you understand better. So these are the two peaks I'm talking about. So this is 200 frames per second, that is the gap between the second and the third pulse, which is very, very small. So now, if I go to two picosecond, three picosecond, eight picoseconds, you see there, you can see the peaks are coming up. And around 14 picoseconds, there's a very, very long time delay between second and the third pulse. We distinctly could see peaks between the two diagonal peaks along the diagonal. And this is a real experimental data. And this evolution of this cross peaks that you see here is directly seen from the experiment, which is direct experimental proof of this hydrogen bond making and breaking process. And 2DIR is the only experiment uh, which actually the first experiment to give you this kind of a dynamics, this exchange process that you can follow over time. And you can see direct experimental signatures of hydrogen bond being made and broken. So now, because now we have talked about this 2TIR and the different kinds of dynamics, one in the uh, fluctuations, the other in the chemical exchange. Now we will talk about the applications of 2 dr So we know for the all we are doing, we are exciting vibrational probes or IR probes. And what are these IR probes? These are the same probes that we excite in, in IR absorption spectroscopy. So in other words, these are the chemical groups or the bonds. And these chemical groups and bonds, they are present in any molecule because the mo molecules, any molecule, for even a radiative molecule, we need a, two atoms and a bond. So as long as it is IR active, that particular mode, we can get an IR spectrum. And if we can get an IR spectrum, we'll be able to get a 2D IR spectrum. So all we are doing, we are get, trying to do the same IR spectrum, but using femtosecond laser pulses, and we are interacting these pulses multiple times with our sample. So as you can understand that we do not need to attach any external probe like a fluorophore or something. And this, any molecule, independent of what kind of uh, box will, uh, will put the molecule. Like we as chemists, we normally talk about organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry materials or uh, biological chemistry or biochemistry. So, and this, as I started, we can think about molecules from these different divisions of all the uh, parts of chemistry. So, and all these different molecules, as I mentioned initially, they have dynamics, they move around, and 2DIR actually can measure the dynamics from all different points, from materials, from biology, from chemistry, the small organic molecules, inorganic clusters, as long as we can get an IR spectrum. So as you can understand, the application of 2TIR should cover a wide range of topics. So I will only mention a couple of them here. Some of them are old papers, seminal papers of this 2TIR, 
of these exchange processes. Uh, first time ever people could see this hydrogen one making and baking or transients of these interactions, which you always assumed or looked from a simulation point of view, a theoretical point of view, uh, these kind of uh, things. And I also will give some examples in uh, other complex environments in biology. So first example I will take, this was published in 2005 in Science. So Mike Fair's group, they took you know, phenol in benzene CCL for mixture. So phenol, which is OH, they changed it to OD, which because OD absorbs in this range. So as we know, this phenol will have some OH5 kind of interaction with the benzene B. And because of the fluctuation of these molecules, it will be an OH5 going back and forth, back and forth. So what will happen? There'll be this interaction, transient interaction, interactions being made and broken. So as you can see, this is the complex phenol peak. This is the free phenol peak. And this is like a 200 frame per second. And now if you look at a 16 picosecond, uh, like a time scale or like a like later time scale, but still it's a 16 picosecond. Picosecond stands for minus 12 seconds. You see this kind of cross peaks uh, other, uh, along with the diagonal peaks, which says that the complex goes to free phenol, the free phenol goes to complex. So there is this interaction which are made and broken. So at the same time, a similar experiment, actually it, this was published uh, a week before the science paper, independently by Robin Hochstrasser's group, I think Penn. So they looked into this acid, uh, ac acetonitrile methanol mixture. And if you see this frequency, these are the pump and flow frequencies. And you see these free wave numbers, these are the numbers where the nitrile stage absorbs. So you can think about there's a hydrogen bonded state, there's a non-hydrogen bonded state, and V equals zero, one, all these cases, there are this exchange processes happening. So V equals zero to one is this uh, set of peaks. We have two diagonal peaks, and you see here, this, uh, they're initially from initial to final, there are peaks are coming up. If you plot, in a, not in a contour map, but maybe in a mountain way, it's understand better. And it's also happening in case of the uh, one to two kind of transition. So that means this exchange is also happening in the excited state. So then later on in 2019, this is, you know, we are talking now about energies, lithium chloride solution, aqueous electrolytes. My chair did a uh, seminal work here where he's talking about this, you know, if you take only uh, thiocyanate, this is my probe, a methyl thiocyanate in water, and you add lithium uh, chloride, so basically you're making lithium chloride solutions, so one peak, it, it, there is this interaction to this kind of an interaction, which gives a second population. And there also, you see that it's cross peaks, so, and you can get the time scales of this kind of processes, and this it gives you a very fundamental understanding of this dynamics that is happening between a water-like environment to a lithium-like environment. So now if you move to towards biology, so we can see this is a work done in my clear's lab. Uh, so this we know this myoglobin as a heme protein. And there are multiple uh, substates can be seen. So myoglobin, we know that binds carbon monoxide, which is kind of fatal. So in the lab, with the test tube, we can bind my myoglobin uh, carbon monoxide. This is my IR probe. That means I can monitor this frequency. So what happened? There is a helix known as the E helix. So this E helix actually moves back and forth. And because it moves back and forth, this carbon monoxide, this, this carbonyl carbon monoxide, is blocked at some point, unblocked at other point. So in other words, the carbon monoxide environment changes over time. Funny thing is, it doesn't happen in myoglobin alone. However, if you make a single mutation to myoglobin, or two mutations to myoglobin, that means you change in the active site, you change one amino acid, two amino acids, immediately this kind of uh, motion starts, uh, becomes faster or something, 
In other words, in only wild type myoglobin, you have one peak, which is A1, uh, and then you have both A1 and A3. There means the two states because of motion. One is occluding the hydro uh, carbonyl, uh, the carbon monoxide, one is carbon monoxide exposed. And so, because what is happening, because this is moving, there's an imidazole the group which kind of reorients with uh, relative to this carbon monoxide, so frequency changes. Now we know that there are two peaks. But we don't know whether how fast this helix moves. Is does it move in a second time scale? Does it move in a millisecond, nanosecond, picosecond? We don't. So a 2D experiment when performed, let's say we do one kind of uh, one single mutant L29I or a double mutant T67R in S92D. These are enzymes, and these are important. These act as important as the enzymes. So you see. As a function of time, even 48 picoseconds, or in this case, in 32 picoseconds, you see this kind of cross peaks coming, which tells you that you know this helix motion, which I was talking here. This helix motion is actually happening in a faster time scale. So, in other words, the double mutant, if you actually fit it to a kinetic model, the switching time we get directly from the experiment. And that is the, you know, the change or the motion of a particular alpha helix segment in a big protein is happening at uh, 76 picoseconds. So that is exactly what I was saying. When we talk about the slow protein processes, there might be processes which are happening much faster, which are fundamental to the final whatever enzymatic activity of this particular. And for the single substrate, this happens in let's say uh, 47 weeks. So this is another work done by Martizani. So here they looked at this amyloid aggregation. So the amyloids we know go from monomers to oligomers to fibrils. So and so they go from a random coil to an amyloid beta sheet kind of structure. And it's this amyloid random coil and beta sheet is kind of change over time. And because we're spreading into dimensions, we can get better information of this dynamics. And also we can label a particular part with an isotope, let's say C13O18 of a carbonyl, because there are many carbonyls in this amyloid. So we can get local information of a particular amyloid. So we can even figure out site-specific information in which part of this amyloid or random coil actually starts getting structured faster compared to the other amyloid. Other part of it. So now people talk about this green solvent. So this is a deep eutectic solution, and this is a raline, which is a mixture of this uh, ammonium, uh, this uh, this uh, urea, and uh, this other moiety. So this is called raline, and this. So now that this is the more ma major disadvantage of this kind of deep eutectic solvent, though they're green and people are trying to use it. In biology to chemical synthesis of solvents, the problem is these are extremely viscous. So what people are trying to figure out is to add a little bit of water, but still this deep eutectic solvent should be there. That means the melting point, they should be at uh, solvent, uh, the, you know, melting point here we are talking about, this is much higher individual components and when we have this particular ratio, this is much lower at the room temperature. So now we have showing you data at different waiting times. You see, as I mentioned in the fluctuation case, so things get upright. So the way to read this data set is this is along left to right, the amount of water increases, top to down, the waiting time increases at the time between the uh, second and the third possible. So as you see, when you have only deep solvents viscous, we can see there's a kind of diagonal even at 30 seconds. However, as we increase more and more water, in 10 W, we have 10 moles of water here. At 20 picoseconds, it becomes more or less vertical or upright. In 15 water, that means we add more water, the dynamic is faster, even 10 picoseconds is getting faster. So in other words, as we monitor these diagonally elongated peaks to upright and how fast they become upright, we can figure out that is, we add water and water, water and water, as expected, the uh, dynamics become optimal. 
And if you see the dynamic time scales, you see in pure reality it was 73 meters per second, and in 15 uh, is to one water railing systems, it's around three meters. So I will, uh, I am almost done here. I will just show this is the, uh, my lab here. This is a 2D laboratory at NCL. So this is the laser which we call the uh, one box oscillator amplifier. And the output here is the red light at 800 uh, nanometer, which comes out, and we have the uh, we have the optical uh, parametric amplifier OPA here. We have where the IR is being created to 10 per second IR, and this is like the where we focus at the sample. We keep the sample here, and we have a, uh, the pulses are coming here. We do it in a slightly different uh, way. Uh, however, this is the monochromator where the Frequencies are being dispersed, and this is the array detector. We can think about there are many strips along this way, and which is collecting all the different uh, frequencies. And then it is connected. You see the students here. This is connected to our computer. So whatever uh, we have, you see the sample cell here. Whichever sample is here, we are getting some signal, and then we can run the experiment once we align this entire system, and we'll get a to the IR spectrum. So here you see the students, you know, this is the actually the first 2 dr lab in India, and there are a few labs abroad, of course, and the 2 dr is a novel technique. I'd say the first kind of the experimental result paper on 2DR came in 2000, so it's not even a 20-year-old technique, and you have to align the system. There are a lot of optics involved, uh, but, you know, things have become much easier uh, when I did as a student, we took a long alignment. Now it doesn't take that long to align. And you see these are like zoomed into the optics. You, see, you can see these fancy patterns. And these are different optics. Which you, these are the knobs you tweak to align systems. And as I mentioned, you know, spectroscopy is a bridge between experiment and theory. So, you know, the students in my lab not to, uh, so do the experiment, that means they do the synthesis. They also, we also do our own theory. Uh, and then we do the exp uh, experiments. One of the experiments we do is 2 add. There are other experiments, steady state and dynamic state that we do, and which forms the bridge. So a student in my lab is getting trained in theory, uh, synthesis, as well as handling lasers and spectrometers and uh, you know analyzing the data. So, I mean, so most of the time people are trying to do the experiments, but that's not exactly what we do all the time. We also go out to restaurants or parties. Sometimes the students, they go out by themselves to other places to have a vacation together. And uh, so if uh, someone is interested uh, to, you know, maybe a, do a project or a PhD in 2 uh please contact me. Here, my email is there s.baxi.ncl.res.in. And in the near future, actually, uh, there will be another online workshop and project which talks about more details in 2DI spectroscopy, which covers the basic principles to applications. And uh, so if someone is interested in that, you know, uh, please, uh, uh, you know, I will pass on the message to the different institutes. If interested, you can register. It might be a multi-day process. Uh, this is it's an online thing. It will give a better uh, thing. And if you need to know more about this, this book, Concepts and Methods of 2D IR Spectroscopy by Martin Sani and Peter Ham, uh, if you want to know more details, you can read there. So thank you. Thank you for it. Well, I think, uh, thank you, Professor Bakchi. But I think quickly we will have some time for uh, quick questions. If you, uh, if anybody had, please raise your queries. Either you put it in chat box or otherwise uh, using your microphones, please. Does anyone has any query? Well, I don't uh, see any, but anyway, uh, let me summarize. Uh, Professor San Bakshi has nicely explained a, a, the basic difference between a steady state and 2D IR spectroscopy and has explained beautifully the dynamics of uh, 
this uh, structural and conformational changes which might be taking place due to uh, is, I, interactions, specifically hydrogen bonding interactions. One quick question, Professor Bhakti, can I uh, put it here? Um, that is, uh, you see, among different complex molecules, if we focus on hydrogen, hydrogen bonding interaction alone, can we differentiate uh, among them? Can we distinguish uh, between them and then tell that exactly, yes, it could be like this under certain uh, fixed conditions of experiment? Uh, can you just repeat the question once more, please? Yeah, question was just you have taken the cases of uh, myoglobin. Mm -hmm. you know, suppose I take another protein mm -hmm. and um, by looking at, focusing at this particular uh, hydrogen bonding uh, uh, dynamics of the hydrogen bonding interaction, can we differentiate mm -hmm. among these different proteins or complex molecules? Yeah, so the thing is every protein, uh, this is a good question, so every protein will have its own signature in the IR and every protein will have different you know, fluctuations. So by looking into these uh, different uh, signatures of proteins, this hydrogen bond making and breaking, this other fluctuation, we will be able to differentiate the dynamics of different proteins. And not only different uh -huh. proteins, the same protein, if you make some changes in a protein, that will also be able to differentiate. So that will be a signature of that protein. We can primary. actually get a signature of part. And people have actually, what I did not mention, today also has been used to actually look into the structures. Uh, and uh, that people will, uh, uh, like, we, we can figure out even by 2DIR, like, the, uh, in the structural part as well as the dynamics part, like, and you can think about the signatures people have talked oh. about. Okay, fine. Thank you. So, if anybody, uh, yes, uh, I think I see some question, please. Uh, these are what are the blue, Mohammed Safiullah. What are the blue colored uh, Kenya peaks in slide 23 and 24? Could you please uh, go through this? Yeah, so uh, so this 23 and 24, as I mentioned, so you see, uh, these are these were the 0 to 1. So now if you see here, the other peaks that I showed before, let's say uh, if I go here, you see 24, I am saying this is my uh, diagonal and harmonicity because I am plotting the initial frequency here, the pump here, the probe on the x-axis, the pump on the y-axis. So the probe frequency is shifted downwards and it's that's why in this spectrum it shifts towards the right. And so this is my transition, pumping, uh, whether any, any transitions from between V equals 0 and V equals 1. And this is where the final transition happens between V equals 1 to V equals 2. However, this looks different. So the reason it looks different, the only reason, because in this case, my fair plots are that the convention is different. As I mentioned, it's up to us which axis I want to plot for. Here, the pump axis is the X axis and the probe axis is the Y axis. So in other words, let's say you are looking from this direction. And now it is shifted towards where the frequency is shifted. And so this is my diagonal and harmonicity. And this uh, frequencies that we see are due to one to two transitions. And these red ones are zero to one transitions. So the other question I can see here is to how to measure the rate of change of conformation. So this is a very good question. I did not go into the details of the mathematics here. So we can think about a process, let's say A reversible B, that we always all, all, always study in chemical kinetics when we do the course. So we can derive the expression for A reversible B, and all we, we have the intensities here, the concentration of A and B as a function of time, or we do not know what the exchange rates, and just if we model using the kinetic uh, model A reversible B, we'll be able to get to that, uh, you know, we'll be able to find the time scale, where we are, the way it is going from A to B or B to B. So I can see these are the two different questions.
Any other questions? No, I think uh, there are no more questions. So I believe, uh, please join me in thanking Professor Bakshi again for a very nice and beautiful talk uh, he presented about uh, this IR, 2D IR spectroscopy. Thank you, Professor Bakshi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So, Professor Pandey, shall I put it off and then start again? Professor Pandey. We will continue here only. Just give us a we'll continue here only. Okay. We are just so, changing the bit a little bit here and there. Okay. Us... So, now we have another speaker with us, our own colleague, uh, Professor Ravindra Pandey. Uh, so, let me introduce uh, Professor Pandey first and then uh, we will request him to deliver his talk.